Hey, it's been a minute, but we're back at it. And so let's recap. Uh, I do videos about atheist witchery. I don't have anything supernatural going on in my practice. If you do have supernatural things going on in your practice, that's awesome. Stick around. We probably have more in common than you think. Um, so let's do the intro. So today's topic, let's talk about familiars and whether or not your pet is a familiar or if your pet is just a pet. So let's get into the weeds to just start out with and talk about what is a familiar. Uh, usually when we're talking about a familiar, we're talking about a spirit. In European folklore and in folklore around the world, humans live right beside spirits. These could be spirits of the departed, these could be spirits of natural elements, these could be spirits that are supernatural creatures, like the Fae. These creatures aren't necessarily malevolent or benevolent, they're usually neutral in the same way that nature is neutral. But also like nature, these spirits should be feared and respected. For example, a Swedish farm might have a resident Tompti, which is like a very small old man that is a protective spirit for the farm. Um, you can anger this spirit by mistreating animals, by swearing, or just doing things that the spirit sees uh, as being disrespectful to the farm. And this spirit can uh, poison you and kill you. But at the same time, if you show respect to the animals and the farm, then you have nothing to fear from the Tomti. They're actually like a helpful spirit. And as with most spirits, to appease them, you are expected to make offerings to them. And I really feel like this is a way for humans to assert a sense of control over something that is completely beyond their control like the weather or, you know, sickness and things like that. So an ongoing theme with witches and their relationship to nature is that they have, they can assert their will over these chaotic elements of nature. And one of the ways they might do that is by directly communicating with these spirits. So a familiar is any kind of spirit that is in direct service to or partnership with a witch. And this spirit can provide services for the witch. Um, it can give access to knowledge to the witch. It's the perks that you might expect of having a supernatural partner or servant. And in any folklore that warns against meddling in this chaos of nature, it might depict these familiars as being terrifying creatures to warn against this kind of thing. Because often, you know, nature is terrifying and it will kill you. So it makes sense that uh, it might be depicted as dangerous monsters. In the 17th century, we see a lot of detailed recordings of familiars being cats, rats, bats, crows, dogs. And in these recordings, sometimes it's noted that the familiars, even though they are, you know, demons in the form of animals, that they behave completely like run of the mill animals. And I have a suspicion that that is because these are run of the mill normal animals in the same way that the humans that owned these animals were just regular humans that were trying not to be murdered uh, as witches. Like they were just pets. These folks had pets, um, they were on trial for witchcraft, and they were accused of having, you know, supernatural demons. And in the documentation, it's noted like, oh, this demon just looks like a regular cat, acts like a regular cat. Like, oh man, how sneaky. Also a common theme that you'll see in these records of interrogation are how the familiars maybe appeared in the person's bedchamber out of thin air, or um, they appeared on a significant date, um, or maybe they talked with like a human voice. But I think that we can obviously be really skeptical of any sort of recordings that are made of someone that's being interrogated because like we know that interrogation is not a trustworthy way to gather information. Also, these records may have been embellished to justify the murder of the person that was being tried for witchcraft. So again, not a great like reference. So anytime I hear someone gatekeeping whether or not an animal is a familiar based on these records um, of interrogations, like I have to think like, like 
it's not a good source. Let's not use records of interrogation during which trials as an outline of what our practice should look like at all. And often you will see when people are giving information about whether or not, you know, your animal is a pet or a familiar, they will cite these um, qualities of a true familiar. And if those qualities are based off of folklore, um, witch trials, or, you know, what they feel in their heart to be true, like, I think that we can, I don't want to say disregard. Okay, maybe disregard that advice. So if we, if we disregard those rules as like categorizing your pet as a familiar, like a familiar has to appear to you from thin air. It has to appear to you on a specific special date. It has to speak with you in a human voice. It has to like, you know, telepathically communicate with you. Just all these other things. If we set that aside and don't use that as a way to categorize a familiar, then how do we categorize a familiar? Okay, so a familiar is a spirit maybe like a, you know, demonic spirit or whatever. Um, and I think anyone that has owned a pet can tell you that all animals have the quality of being like a magical spirit, like being intelligent, mysterious, seeming to appear out of nowhere, seeming to be attuned with the unseen. Like I have not met an animal that doesn't meet those, those requirements. And I don't want anybody to tell you that their animal is like more fill in the blank than your animal. (laughs) Like all animals are absolutely amazing and give me complete sense of awe when I'm around them, even if they are very derpy. Uh, One of my dogs is very elderly and has very few teeth left. So he's in the constant state of blep where his tongue is hanging out and he is still like absolute uh, mythical, magical creature. So is your animal a spirit? I think, I think so. Um, So the other quality is, does your animal enhance your practice? And for me, honestly, the answer to that is no. I have a house full of pets. I basically have a zoo at this point and not one of them helps me with my practice. My cats jump on my altar and knock things off. My dogs bark at me for their attention when I'm trying to focus. Right now, as I'm filming this, I've got a dog near me that's snoring really loud, and I don't know if the camera's picking that up or not. Um, At that point, they are the opposite of a point of focus. They are actually a point of distraction. (laughs) So I love all of my pets with my whole heart, but they are definitely not uh, a part of my practice. So I wouldn't say that any of them are my familiar, Um, but that's just me. I'm, I'm wondering if your animals help with your practice. Do you have a familiar? Do you have a really close relationship with an animal that is directly tied to your practice? And I have to know, like, comment below, how do they help you with your practice? So my thoughts to wrap this up, I know this is a short one and it's pretty cash, but I had read a few things and, you know, seen the random TikToks that are like, oh, it's annoying when someone calls their pet their familiar because a familiar is like this really important idea. You know, like the same thing where In my relationship, uh, I am a twin flame or I am a soulmate, whereas everyone else's relationship is just normal. Like, you don't see someone's relationship with their pet as being, you know, supernatural, um, otherworldly, because you're not in that relationship. So it's easy to look at somebody um, calling their gecko their familiar and, like, you know, internally rolling your eyes at that. But I just think it's illogical to assume that anyone has a pet and they don't like have that absolute, like almost divine connection with their pet. Like we have little pieces of nature that live with us in our homes. And it's just one of the most amazing things about being a human is having those relationships with animals. So I don't know, I never, I don't think we should ever downplay that. And if you can work that into your practice, then more power to you. Seriously though, comment below. Like, oh, if you have like an unexpected familiar, comment below. Like, does anybody have like a screaming cockroach that they use with their practice? Like, I need to know. I might do a pet reveal in a video because, well, I think you've seen a lot of my pets in various videos. But um, this past year, 
I got into the hobby of aquascaping and aquarium keeping and it got very out of hand very quickly. So if anybody wants an aquarium tour, I can definitely make a video about that. Also, I finally finished this room that I'm sitting in, like decorating wise. So maybe I'll do like a room that I film in tour. But I'm thinking to get this year started, like I'm going into, I'm going to go into 2022 very cautiously. So maybe I should do some really, really easy videos because I have a deep dive planned where I kind of want to seriously talk about something that's been on my mind. And I just, I have a bunch of half scripts written about it and I'm such a coward because I just, I have not been able to film that video. And I think that that's been what I've been stuck on and why I haven't been able to get videos out for the past, I don't know, months. Anyway, thank you for sticking around, even though it's been a very long time since I put out a video. And to my wonderful commenter who was concerned about me, I'm still alive and I really appreciate you uh, thinking about me. <laughs> but I, I totally get that because I do follow YouTubers that'll like drop off and I'll be like very concerned about them. Like, oh my gosh, I hope they're okay because they didn't even say anything. They just dropped off and how rude. And now that's me. And I'm <laughs> and I apologize for that. Anyway, until next time, bye-bye.